Welcome everyone. It is three o'clock in my time zone. Uh, my name is Anna Grace. I work with the sites team at GBCI. I would like to welcome everyone to our community call this month. We hold these regularly throughout the year to share program updates, detailed project presentations, and, and topical webinars. Our topic today is nurturing health and well being through sustainable site design. We actually explored this topic back in June of 2020, which feels a very long time ago now. Um, some of you may have um, been there with us. Dr. Kathy Wolf um, of the University of Washington presented. We are pleased today to explore that further, featuring examples from two projects in Montana, one in Maine, which are covering opposite sides of the country. Um, thanks for pulling up the um, agenda slide, Danielle. Here's a look at how we're going to go through it today. Danielle will provide a um, brief sites program update, and then we will hear how Fort Missoula Regional Park and Colby College addressed the health and well being of their site users leveraging the sites program along the way as part of their journey. Uh, first, I'd like to remind everyone we are recording the session. We will be sending this out to all registrants afterwards. We encourage you to send questions in the Q&A box. We encourage you to send comments in the chat box. Um, feel free to send these throughout the presentation. We will try to get to all of them. Um, as with previous community calls, this live session is approved for one site specific CEU and the GBCI course ID will be shared for self-reporting in the materials that we send after the session. We will also send a PDF of the slides as well for your perusal. So thanks again for joining us. We have a lot to cover. I would like to turn it over right to Danielle now. Um, take away the screen, thank you. Thanks, Anna Grace. And hello, welcome everyone. Let me get to my next slide. So just for those who are now new to sites and are just not too familiar, we do a quick introduction and an update. Um, as many of you know, sites is based on the understanding that land is a crucial component of the built environment. Developed and managed landscapes have the capacity to protect and even regenerate natural systems, thereby enhancing the ecosystem services they provide to a community, which is the foundation of the sites framework. Ecosystem services such as sequestering carbon, cleaning air and water, controlling flooding, regulating climate, and much more. They appreciate and value in this way, and their economic and social value are highly significant. SITES provides a comprehensive tool to better ensure these life-enhancing landscapes and outdoor spaces are valued and prioritized during a development process, and that the outcomes are sustainable, resilient, and regenerative. One of our SITES projects described this as maximizing life per square foot, which we just love. Uh, so today we have uh, 275 projects that are participating with sites, which I'm thrilled to say this covers over 1.2 billion square feet of outdoor space that is either already certified and sustainable or seeking to be sustainable. 38 of these projects have achieved certification or pre-certification. For those not familiar with pre-certification, this recognition focuses on projects in their planning phase and do not have to be constructed yet. So as you can see here, sites apply, is applying to a wide variety of project types uh, and regions. We're covering 40 US states in Washington, DC, and we're in 17 countries. So while designing and, and constructing sustainable landscapes lays a very important and critical foundation for site sustainability, ongoing site op operations and maintenance is where we can really secure over the long term a focus of meeting our global and local goals of mitigating climate change, fostering resilience and improving health and wellness in the community. The focus on new construction is vital, but there are many landscapes that have already been built that seek these same goals. And with that, I, we so to address this gap and the growing interest from built projects, GBCI is now offering uh, new, uh, is expanding its offerings for ex ex existing built landscapes. Projects can now be evaluated by their sustainable site management practices and are encouraged to report on their social, environmental, and economic benefits. Built projects can ultimately earn site certification for their actions and leadership. So at this point, we're seeking partners and projects to collaborate with us, either with projects to test with, as well as, their, as, well as subject matter expertise in site management and landscape performance. Uh, yesterday, we held, our, we held our first webinar to introduce this new offering with Landscape Architecture Foundation. Um, if you missed this, we do contact us via sites at gbci.org. We can send you the recording. Um, you can also insert your email in the chat box if it's easier with this, with this interest. 
But just to provide a little bit more context on the process that we'll be following for developing this adaptation of the sites rating system, the first step was to develop an initial guidance to apply sites to a built project. This involved reviewing the prerequisites and credit requirements in the sites V2 rating system, ident identifying which is applicable and relevant as is, uh, which needed modifications, which credits may not be applicable, and what else we needed to add to it. So we went through this exercise and have developed an initial pilot guidance document. This next step uh, is to put the guidance document to use by real projects. So we did a call for interest this past spring and received an overwhelming response and interest in this adaptation. We will then look for feedback from participating projects, uh, other subject matter experts, or any other stakeholders who wish to weigh in with their expertise. We will review what worked and didn't work and make updates. Finally, the last step will be to finalize and release a refined sites for existing landscapes framework. And I'll just quickly end with um, what kind of projects this applies to. Again, this is for existing built projects, not uh, anyone that is going under undergoing new construction or major renovation. We do assume there might be some site updates and those are permitted. Uh, we would like these projects to be completed and operating for one year minimum. Uh, there are no size restrictions, but we do ask that if you have a project over 100 acres that you let us know, contact us so we can just discuss how it applies. And then it uh, does apply to all project types and locations. And I also want to show this is our pricing structure and I'm showing the new construction as well as what we're currently offering for existing landscapes pilot. So if you're familiar with our pricing, you'll see that we provide discounts to USGBC and ASLA members. This carries over as well as a discount for when you combine a registration and certification payment. So in addition to these discounts, GBCI is offering a lowered rate on certification fees for the first 25 projects that register to seek certification as an existing landscape. Again, do email us if you're interested with a, about a certain project that you wanna test this with so we can provide you with this pilot discount. And that email is sites at gbci.org. And now I'm excited to pass the presentation to our guest speakers who will discuss two newly certified sites projects in Montana and Maine. So starting with Fort Missoula Regional Park, this is the largest, this is sorry, the first site certified project in the state of Montana. And it's also the largest park that has achieved site certification to date. Following Fort Missoula, we will hear from the Colby College team who recently certified the Harold Alfund Athletics and Recreation Center. This is the first site project to achieve gold level certification in New England. Notably, the facility also achieved LEED Platinum certifications for its green building practices. And I must add that this is also the second site certified project at Colby College. So our two speakers for the Fort Missoula project today are Donna Gockler and Garrick Swanson, both from the City of Missoula's Parks and Recreation Department. As director, Donna has guided the Missoula community in the development and adoption of several land use and management plans and improvements ranging from neighborhood parks to regional pathways and conservation lands to water parks. Partnerships, empowerment, inclusion, and engagement are what Donna views as the keys to the department's success. Garrick is the landscape architect at Missoula Parks and Recreation. He supports the community in the development and adoption of sustainable master plans. And he has focused his career on public service to provide innovative designs of outdoor spaces by using a multidisciplinary approach of sociology, ecology, preservation and character of cities, urban places and local culture. So, and with that, I'll pass that to Donna. Maybe it's Garrick. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Donna Gockler. I'm the Director of Parks and Recreation. And as we go through this presentation, I want to give a shout out to uh, several landscape architects who helped guide us through this. Uh, Jenny Miners Hagen, uh, Mary Jane Gilman, DHM Design Group out of the Denver area, uh, the Land Group out of Idaho, and our own local team uh, led by Neil Miner and one of my uh, partners in this project, uh, Garrick Swanson. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on Fort Missoula Regional Park, a park for everyone. Uh, context, we serve a population of approximately 130,000 county residents and about 70,000 city residents. <clears throat> Excuse me. The park is located in the southwest uh, portion of our community. 
It is 156 acres and it is connected by a bitter trail that goes from downtown Missoula to downtown Hamilton, about 50 miles. It is in a historic landscape. We are part of a historic district. And uh, we actually even have future plans to reclaim a gravel mining site to add to the overall park. The 156 acres includes uh, 94 acres of new development and uh, approximately 62 acres of a, a completely renovated park. A little bit of fort history. Uh, I mentioned it is within a historic district. The area was settled uh, for, uh, by the military for um, the era and purposes of uh, protecting uh, white settlers from uh, our indigenous populations. Uh, it was a open fort with no walls, which is very unique. It was valued for its open view sheds. Um, as far as I know, there were no uh, confrontations um, at the site itself. Uh, there was a fort reconstruction area uh, era during the uh, industrialization of our country. And so there's city modern uh, architecture and landscape architecture uh, nearby and within the park. <clears throat> the park itself interprets the civil civilian conservation core era of our history. It is also attached to one of the um, largest, most intact World War II internment camp where uh, Japanese and Italian uh, individuals were held captive and we've done included some interpretation with that as well and then uh, the uh, park or the uh, fort uh, opened up uh, shortly after World War II to other uses. The guiding principles uh, for the park so uh, this park uh, and the history have been ongoing for quite some time and during the initial planning processes back in 2001 and 2002, the public told us that they wanted to protect and enhance unique historic values related to Fort Missoula, that the park plan should encompass as many diverse activities as possible, should serve all abilities, all ages, all incomes, be designed and constructed with environmental sensitivity, balance undeveloped and developed park plan, maintain the natural views and vistas, that adequate infrastructure should be available to support park activities, that there should be wayfinding and interpretation included and sensitive to surrounding neighbors. So part of the mitigation, uh, we acquired the land in 1995 uh, using general obligation open space uh, funds, which were voted upon by residents of Missoula including buying 100 acres from the state, University of Montana. We um, are looking to preserve and create a, uh, preserve a sense of place uh, through interpretation, through preservation, and through connection. The design and architecture of Fort Missoula Regional Park is definitely a living legacy to the Civilian Conservation Corps. One of the things uh, that excites me most about this is not only is this an important part of our national history and heritage, uh, but it was from Fort Missoula that many of the uh, troops from the CCC were deployed to our national parks and our national lands. The CCC has a particular um, presence in the history of parks and recreation as a industry. And so it's a natural um, place and uh, opportunity for us to interpret. You'll notice that the entrance to our park uh, looks very similar to a national park. And we are one of very few sites in the nation that actually has a Iron Mike statue or a CCC worker uh, depicting uh, the work, uh, often firefighting, uh, something we do more of now in the West than we used to. The uh, rustic spirit uh, behind the log and timber construction uh, at the Bella Vista. And so these uh, features at the park really reflect what you might see in an older, uh, very uh, older state or federal um, national park. Uh, and some of the things related to sites that we're very excited about is a lot of our materials were locally sourced. 
uh, the rocks in the uh, in the uh, uh, facility. The timbers in the facility are from very nearby, and uh, we had initially thought that uh, some of this stuff was going to be pre prefabricated and shipped in, uh, but instead we were able to locally source it with and uh, install it with local craftspeople. And I'm going to turn it over to Garrick now. Uh, he uh, filled the role, many roles with this project, but one of the primary roles was keeping us uh, on track and more importantly, reporting all of uh, the sites related um, criteria. So go, take it away, Garrick. All right. Thank you, uh, Donna. Uh, once again, I, I, I am Garrick Swanson, uh, one of three um, LAs with the City of Missoula Parks and Recreation department. Um, uh, SITES was a um, tremendous fit for Fort Missoula Regional Park as it is a legacy project reflecting the greater Missoula area history and providing a public landscape for current and future generations. Fort Missoula Regional Park was a clear opportunity to both learn and demonstrate the city of Missoula's commitment to climate sustainability Resili resiliency, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sites, sites was an ideal structure of prescribed outcomes that reflected the project's uh, guiding principles and public outreach that dates back to 1995. Um, in this slide, this is an aerial imagery of uh, phase one taken in 2014 uh, prior to construction and then an aerial in 2017 uh, uh, post-project completion of phase one. Uh, there are many sections within the within the site's B2 reference guide that the that the project successfully successfully prescribed. The top three credits that the project scored exceptionally well in were uh, section two, pre-design, section six, human health and well-being, and section section seven, uh, construction specifically to restoring soils and um, fiber reusable vegetation, rock and soils from disposal. Um, engaging uh, stakeholders and uh, users um, uh, dates back to 1995. Um, throughout the project, uh, we have we have a um, robust uh, documentation of all our public meetings and outreach. Um, starting in 1995, the public passed an open space bond, which allowed us to uh, acquire um, 100 acres from the University of Montana, an adjacent landowner, which would allow for the expansion of the park. In 2001 through 2002, I referenced that extensive and robust public um, uh, process and uh, plan adoption of the master plan. Uh, being located within the Fort Missoula Historic District, we went through a mitigation plan with the State Historic Preservation Office in 2008, um, which ended up in recommendation of CCC interpretation within the design. At that time, we completed phase one design with phase two completed in 2012. In 2014, the um, uh, public passed a um, general obligation bond for a total of 42 million with 36 million dedicated to the development of Fort Missoula Regional Park. And then nothing um, speaks more than uh, the overwhelming public support of passing the um, bond in, in our support for this part. In 2015, we had a, a public open house and kickoff to the design and construction. In 2017, the Bitter Trail 
was completed as long, along with the opening of the South Reserve Pedestrian Crossing. Reserve Street is one of the busiest or is the busiest road in the state of Montana. In April 2017, phase one opened and in July 2018, phase two opened with a uh, full completion in July 2019. Uh, looking at um, being a um, being a developed park, human health and um, well-being is one of the core um, benefits of the park. The park is programmed and designed to maximize opportunities, promote recreation for all, and accommodate both primary and secondary user groups. The park is open year-round daily from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. with peak use after 4 p.m. and on weekends, typically between April and October. A variety of free recreational park facilities and programs are available to all that support both physical and social connections. The City of Missoula Parks and Recreation Department is not able to offer all um, free programs. If staff is involved, a minimum fee is needed to help recover staffing and operational costs. Um, throughout the park, there are um, four shelters that are available for um, a drop in use unless they are reserved. And there are over five miles of park trails with uh, seven loops identified, including a, a prescription trail in partnership with, with our local hospitals and the city county health department. Um, here uh, you are seeing an image of our uh, Bella Vista um, synthetic multi-use turf field. Uh, this field is lined for soccer, lacrosse and uh, rugby. It also has um, removable rugby goal posts. Um, in addition to the synthetic turf field, there are 10 multi-use fields and uh, multiple general turf areas. Uh, soft, uh, soft ball facilities is just um, one aspect to the park. Uh, Throughout the park, we have um, seven, uh, seven fields. Two of them are available for uh, drop and use. The other five fields are within the Fort Missoula Regional Park 5 plex, which is uh, typically reserved for league play and tournaments. Um, there is ample opportunity for all ages to be able to play out at the park and, and, and for all abilities to enjoy the park. There are a total of four uh, uh, playgrounds throughout the park with appropriate playground equipment for two through five and five through 12 year, year old. Um, we have one of the four playgrounds is specifically designed for not for um for um all inclusive use of all ages and abilities um in addition to the uh playgrounds we have a um outdoor exercise equipment area that features uh, that has nine different stations here in the background of the um, image, you can see uh, a section of the um, all-inclusive playground with these orange poles in here. And we also have um, tennis and pickleball available at the park as well. Um, the um, Greens is located within uh, phase two of the project. Uh, the green hosts the start of uh, many um, loop trails plus facilities for horseshoes, bocce ball, and uh, croquet. 
the um, nearby shelter and the photo often support socializing before and after uh, trail runs slash walks. The image on the right is the commons area. Uh, this is the result of a uh, of a uh, design outreach with our youth. And this area is dedicated toward uh, young adults, giving them a place to call their own for volleyball, um, oversized ping pong tables, basketball, oversized hammocks, street dancing with lighting, and has support for food trucks. And then, um, Kind of transitioning from uh, sports and play, uh, we have our own local uh, mascot, Sergeant Bozo. Sergeant Bozo was adopted in 1928 by Corporal G. T. Hesford as a three years old puppy that won the hearts of the US, US Fourth Infantry as their mascot. His exact resting place is not known, but it is, um, but he is resting somewhere within the historic district of Fort Missoula Regional Park. And we have um, named our um, dog park um, after Sergeant Bozo. We have an area for small dogs and an area for large dogs. Sporting events at the fort is diverse. Um, it goes from soccer to uh, cross country running meets, volleyball, state tournaments for la, for lacrosse, ultimate rugby, softball, um, uh, local um, local leagues, high high school and um, recreational leagues. Um, Upon our first year of being open, the park served over a quarter million users in 2019. Post, uh, post the um, pandemic, we are expected to shatter that quarter million number. Oh. Right. Uh, Social connections. Um, we uh, we chose to focus on the uh, Bella Vista Pavilion and Plaza to meet the social connections requirement. Bella Vista is Spanish for beautiful view. The name Bella Vista was selected to celebrate the views of the Missoula Valley to the west, north, and east from Fort Missoula Region Park. Um, uh, Fort Missoula Regional Park as a whole is the most accessible uh, park in our system. It um, far exceeds um, a ADA standards. The Bella Vista Pavilion and Plaza are not only the stage for a picturesque landscape, it is a central gathering area for all, command center for sports, ceremony, sports events, and play. Um, being, being located within the Fort Missoula Historic District, cultural and um, historic are a significant component to the park. Um, it is, it is um, integrated through the design and architecture and preservation of views and vistas, as well as an interpretive loop, uh, specifically uh, within the within the open space area, we do um, we do uh, celebrate the historic use of um, the open space as it was the um, greatest bitter digging ground in all of the vast Aboriginal terra territories. Um, and then up here, you can see. Uh, a recent photo of some uh, students uh, with our annual partnership with our local tribe uh, planting the um, native uh, bitterroot flower as well as the state flower to restore it back to that area. Uh, 
uh, restoring soils at Fort Missoula Regional Park was a substantial undertaking. Um, historically, uh, Missoula is within the um, within the um, Great Flood of of uh, Missoula. The majority of all our soil during that time was washed um, to the west in um, Western Oregon. So throughout the valley, we have an average depth of, a, of a six inches of topsoil. The construction of Fort Missoula Regional Park disturbed 138 acres out of 156. Of the 138 acres, 30 acres were revegetated soils. Approximately 25 acres were restored soils with 40 acres of athletic and sports fields and 0.1 or 0.8 acres of bio soils. Here you can see an image on the left of the multi-use fields as well as uh, phase one and then about 90% completion on the right image. And then uh, here uh, we're just showing uh, phase two. In phase two, it was a complete, it was already a developed part. So it was a complete reno renovation. All of the um, organic matter was scraped on uh, off site and it was uh, composted on site. And then all the topsoil was removed, stockpiled, and then blended back into that organic matter and spread throughout the site to a minimum depth of six inches. Sites management. Uh, lessons learned and what would we do the same? Uh, we, would, we would use the same public um, uh, process and uh, robust uh, documentation. Uh, we would identify our target credits early and then um, work in the site's um, specifications into the project. And we would continue to submit for all credits at once. What would we do differently? Um, we, would establish a, um, we would establish a file structure early in the process. Uh, coordinate sites with the, with the project stages to help with uh, management, have a dedicated sites project manager to make sure that we are meeting our goals and our milestones to get certification. Use sites as a guiding principle from the, the beginning of the project and also incorporate daily and or uh, weekly um, check-ins to make sure that we are meeting our goals as well. Right. Uh, sites, uh, sites brought value to the project by providing excellent guidance and a resource for innovative design at Fort Missoula Regional Park, future parks and open space projects as a, as a critical component of the built environment. Specific to Fort Missoula Regional Park, sites provided, sites continues to provide benefits through um, the, through the legacy of Fort Missoula area by providing an an example of a sustainable developed park for generations to enjoy. Overall park and uh, community health was improved by utilizing sustainable construction methods that improved soil quality and reduced carbon emissions, re reduced water use, use and fosters wildlife habitat by utilizing native and climate appropriate species that contribute to the native eco region as well as the use of um, bioswells to capture and help clean stormwater to protect water quality. Um, In closing, it's a parks for all. We're very proud of it. It was a great economic generator and continues to be so a uh, well used park. Uh, meeting sustainability, accessibility goals, as well as our maintenance impact statement and performance. With that, we want to thank you. Thank you, Donna and Garrick. That was really exciting. What a transformation.
of your project and, and a great community asset. Um, so with that, I'm gonna introduce our next speakers. Um, I'm now honored to introduce our next speakers who will be sharing their experience and insight with Colby College's Athletics and Recreation Center. Mina Amuts Amutsen, <laughs> oops, let me go back a little bit, <laughs> is the Assistant Vice President uh, for Facilities and Campus Planning at Colby College since 2015, overseeing planning, capital projects, operations, and sustainability. A broad environmental equity perspective is key to her in advancing sustainability, and she is particularly interested in the integration of natural systems with development, which we are thrilled about. Michael Pulaski is the Office Director and Sustainability Leader for Thornton Thomas City's Portland, Maine office. He has more than 16 years of experience in sustainability consulting with a strong focus on higher education institutions. He's passionate about finding ways to link the building's sustainability elements into the educational curriculum and help institutions advance their campus sustainability goals through building projects. He's also well-versed in all the lead rating systems, living building challenge, passive house and others. And with that, I'll pass that to the team. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Um, so it's uh, we are really proud to present this project. Um, it's called the Harold Alphon Athletics and Recreation Center, um, affectionately called HARC on the campus, but I'll just refer to it as the Athletic Center going forward. So I just wanted to quickly give you a sense of the team um, that was involved in this um, project. So as you can see, it was a it was the architects. Um, we had um, Hopkins from London, Sasaki from Watertown, Mass. And we worked very closely with Michael Van Valkenburg Associates with the landscape architects and Thornton Tomasetti and the civil engineers. So that partnership right from the get-go was really critical. Um, I haven't listed them here, but I also want to mention our construction company, Consigli. Um, they were also involved right from the outset. Um, so I'm going to jump right into the cold goals and the vision for the project. So at 355,000 square feet, the Athletic Center was the single largest project that the college had ever undertaken in its 207-year history. Um, this square footage is about a fifth of our total gross square feet and a fourth of our total developed land area. So um, pretty large. The sheer size and scale, it also offered us an opportunity to focus on land value. Um, you know, as a campus, um, it's a small liberal arts college in Maine, and the focus had been, it's a cultural landscape, actually one of the few in the country, but the focus had been really on little buildings and the little landscape around each building. Um, and we had 50 acres. So it was a chance to introduce new ways to deal with landscape infrastructure, particularly stormwater, and connecting it to regional hydrological flows, not just looking at the campus and the campus boundaries, but looking beyond the campus. So the project program being the Athletics and Recreation Center was obviously focused on health and wellness. And the idea for health and wellness was not restricted just to varsity athletes. We wanted to be truly inclusive and go beyond and invite anybody into this building and onto the site. So it was not restricted just to sports. It was also re um, related to active and passive recreation. And it also offered us a great chance, you know, to, so we went beyond the human focus, included environmental health, um, wanted to increase biodiversity and restore the soil. Um, and, you know, being a campus, this also offered us a chance to engage in research and teaching um, as, as active and passive learning as you move through the site. So um, I want to talk a bit about why we pick site, sites. Um, Colby has a long history of leadership um, in the environmental field. Um, we have one of the oldest environmental uh, studies programs in the nation. And ES is one of our biggest majors. So there is clearly a huge amount of interest and engagement from our students. So when we did the planning study, the students on the panel, the faculty on the panel, very, very keenly interested in a very strong statement about sustainability. Our campus is a designated state wildlife refuge. 
and we have 400 plus acres of woodlands. And that includes 125 acre arboretum and bird sanctuary. So the site and landscape extended, you know, it's, and you'll see it in uh, subsequent slides, but it extends, it spans kind of the entire north edge of the campus. And it, um, there are two major entrances from the west and the east at either end of the site. So we had a fantastic opportunity to make a very visible statement of Colby's commitment to sustainability right as you got into the campus. Um, we could also introduce green infrastructure at a noticeable scale. Um, again, it was a really great amount of acreage for us to work with. And the fact that it was right on campus was really easy for pedestrian and bike access. So you didn't really need to drive. It was literally at people's doorsteps. And last but not least, it was a huge opportunity for us on the operations side to also significantly cut down on maintenance and emissions and cost and fuel and all of that lovely stuff. So um, I will move on to the site itself. Um, as you can see, there's a shaded area, which is a kind of an overlay in a pale blue. And that covers the 50 acres that I mentioned. And in W, I've indicated um, wetlands. So we have five wetlands that we had to work around and the project could not impact the wetlands. So that was the condition we gave our project design and construction teams. Um, and so developing 50 acres required three phases. So the first phase, as you can see, were three recreation fields. And um, I'm gonna use my cursor if you can see it. Um, or Mike, can you pass the cursor around the uh, athletics, the competition fields? So on the right side, you can see three fields and then adjacent to those, you can see other athletics fields. So it really brings our entire sports, outdoor sports complex really close within walking distance. Again, you know, makes the pedestrian bike access incredibly easy. And then phases two and three were focused on the west of the site. And there was a bit of phase three that um, replace the old building with green space. So it's an open green, it's got meadows and it's a beautiful area for, for recreation. So um, we had to do phase one um, completed by 2017 and then phases two and three took from 2017 through um, summer 2021. So we managed to get the building and the other landscape and everything in place. So before I came to Colby, I was at Cornell and had actually participated in a very early sites project, much smaller than this. So I came on board and um, said, hey, we guys, we're gonna do sites. And as Mike remembers well, there was panic. Um, they said, oh my God, what is this? So we talked about it and um, there was a lot of trepidation understandably. And um, you know, nobody in Maine had really done a sites project. So we thought we would pilot a sites um, certification for the first phase for the three fields. And um, I'm gonna call on Micah for a little bit to really talk about, um, you know, what you guys went through, you know, as you sort of try to digest and understand and learn about this. So I'm gonna keep talking. Uh, Mike will yeah, get sorry about, the visuals sorry about back. That. Um, so, um, so while Mike is getting it back, you know, what we did was with the consultant team, with uh, Thornton Tomasetti, they hired an, es an expert insights. And so what she did was she brought us up to speed. So we had a wonderful process engaging um, the architecture team, the landscape team, the, con the contractors, um, Thornton Tomasetti, the engineers, and, you know, almost sort of learned together about sites. You know, there was still a considerable amount of concern about costs. Like, oh my God, this thing's going to cost way more. And we had a fairly limited budget for site and landscape. So um, we had a trustee. Um, he said he would put down some money for um, both lead and site certification. So that got us over that initial fear about you know exceeding cost budgets. So. Um, we actually went forward and got the site certification for the first one, which gave us courage to say, hey, you know, let's set the bar higher for phases two and three. Let's go for site silver. Um, 
So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to ask Mike to jump in and talk about some of the highlights of the project. And we, we wanted to talk about um, four different elements. Uh, it's water and stormwater. Then uh, we talk about the plants, then we talk about the, um, the site materials, and then last health and wellness. So Mike, do you want to take this on? Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mita. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so here's a couple of just of the highlights from, from the whole site design perspective. Um, you know, there are on the, on the north side here, there are these basins underneath the, underneath the field to help capture and clean the stormwater. Um, the irrigation was, there was a lot of attention put to native and, and adaptive plant species so that there's no irrigation required on the site with a few exceptions. Certainly the, the fields do require some, some irrigation. Um, and then the one exception on the site design is really the, is the courtyard that you can see in the, in the middle of the building. We'll talk a little bit more about that, that later. But the, the fields have been, um, were, were designed to minimize, the, um, minimize water use and, um, you know, and have here 15,000 fewer gallons during the season to maintain. So there are um, moisture sensors put in place and, and selection there for, for low, uh, low water use. Um, Move on to the next slide here. From a stormwater standpoint, the whole site um, is designed to actually manage and treat 80%, the 80th percentile storm event, nearly a two and a half inch storm event, which if you think about it over the site of the, the area of this is quite massive. There's over 100,000 square feet of swales in here. Um, and the site is essentially designed so that stormwater generally flows into the swales and then into Rip raft before it goes into the into the into the wooded edge, um, and so this was a major design strategy from from the outset to really use the landscape to help manage the manage the stormwater and keep it as much of it on site and infiltrate as possible. We were a couple of the you know, some interesting planting strategies here. Um, there are there were a number of invasive plants found found on site, uh, and through a collaboration with the some of the students, uh, they were they actually used students as part of their projects um, and classes to actually go in and help remove some of those invasive invasive plant species. So um, one could think of that as free labor. It could also think of it as an educational opportunity, kind of one one in the same. Um, there's a number the whole the the. The site itself, uh, the predominant area of the site here, with, with the exception of the field, is designed with native plants and, and meadows and native meadows um, to help give a more naturalistic feel to the campus. Um, and you can see that in just a in just a moment here. A nice shot of the with these throat with these mode paths as the instead of have paved walking paths, there's these mode paths that you can walk through the meadows. Um, there's rolling landforms uh, that echo the local regional topography. Um, and these, you know, these these meadows here have native flora in them, and clusters of trees to provide to provide shade, um, and really are designed with all living things in mind. Um, one certainly for for humans to to enjoy, but also for all the the plants, insects, the birds, the bees, um, and all the other animals that that thrive in this in this environment. Um, a couple just interesting facts. The you know there's over there's over a million square feet of native plants um, into this into this uh, this site, and our outdoor water use reduction was 99.2 um, percent, and that 0.8 percent was really the the piece that was required for the the courtyard um, in order to maintain the the landscape in the courtyard uh, due to many factors we needed to have some irrigation there. So I'll, I'll jump right in and talk about this mysterious courtyard. So um, if you look at the building, the big white blob, um, that is this little punch rectangle in the middle that's open to the sky and it has trees and plants and large boulders in it. And when we first proposed it, you know, that, that open courtyard is the size of our main administration building on the campus. So you can imagine the size. And you know, there was a lot of concern, oh my God, we'll have to deal with snow and what about this and what about that? And that thing is magical. You know, it, it just sort of brings light into the entire building and the boulders. So we reuse all the soil on the site. So we actually um, re-landscape the site so that the building and the site are kind of, you know, they just work with each other. And we've actually set part of the building into the site 
so that the lower level actually gets cooled by the earth. Um, so it saves us on heating and cooling costs. Um, but the, the, the soil restoration was kind of one of those biggest, the biggest controversy. No one had done something like that before and they just didn't want to. They said, Mina, it's much simpler to simply bring, ship this thing off site, bring in new soil. And we said, you know, soil's precious, we're gonna restore it. Um, it was also really pretty um, compacted. It was clay soil. It had been soccer fields, so it was you know quite um, dense. So for about two, two to three years, we actually moved it to a site that we have close by and um, cut in you know particles of different size to you know improve the drainage, but also organic matter. And we brought it back. So instead of you know the usual four inches of topsoil and seed, we have this incredibly rich two to three feet deep layer of soil across the site. And um, you can see things just thriving. Um, the building that was taken down, um, a lot of the materials from that building were actually reused. And uh, we took the timbers from the old ice arena and actually reused them on the site. So they are quite visible and used because there's a lot of sentiment you know, for that building. Um, and then moving on to um, health and well-being. So um, we wanted to achieve, of course, there's a programmatic goal because we have all these venues for sports and play, but the aspect of mental wellness was as important as physical wellness. Um, so the courtyard inside the building brings nature in the middle of everything. Um, we also use the, the landscape forms as berms. Um, and you know, we have a highway, we have I-95 that is right at the edge of the campus. You have quite a bit of noise um, and the, the berms and the trees and the plantings actually muffle the noise a fair bit. Um, we have pathways through campus that are uh, through the uh, site that link through other paths on campus. So the students, as they are walking, you know, in the usual routes, they just walk onto this. So it doesn't feel like they're crossing a road or going the extra distance. And all of those paths, both the ones that join on campus and on the site have been graded for ADA accessibility. So the entire site is actually accessible to anyone in a wheelchair and comfortably accessible. Um, it's like a 4% or, you know, it's a lower grade. So, um, you know, we've got plenty of other walkways. Um, we've seen people actually create new loops. The community actually comes to walk on our campus. They've always done that. And now they've got actually extra places to walk. And with the site design, we also connect it to um, existing woodland trails. So the campus has six miles of woodland trails. So we wanted to have our pedestrian network actually connect up with the trails so people could just go off-road and into the woods. And then, and, uh, and yeah, from a, yeah, and from, from a site's perspective, um, we scored almost all the points that were available for this health and well-being, so 26 out of the 30 points. So we had points for um, the social social connection, finding the um, providing the space for those social connection opportunities to occur, the site amenities that are available to, um, to everyone there, um, water fountains, bathrooms, filling stations, lighting, and the support for social intention. Um, there's clusters of trees that help provide shade. Um, and then this, this is a view of the interior from the courtyard in the wintertime, um, providing a me mental rest restoration and just a serene view. Um, that's really pretty, pretty amazing when you walk into the facility. Uh, the only thing that we did not get in, in this credit was the edible edible landscaping. And so while Colby has on-site low bush blueberry and other areas, it wasn't uh, quite feasible for this site to hit the threshold. So just a quick note, you know, uh, we, we've also offset the, the use with our RECs and we have a solar array on the campus. So yeah, so I'm looking at the clock and so on. Yeah, moving. we can keep moving. So post-occupancy, I just wanted to dwell a bit on that and lessons learned. So we have some time for Q&A. Uh, we are seeing a much greater use of the outdoors. Um, COVID certainly helped and we kept the campus operational during the um, pandemic. And we actually paid extra attention to our outdoor infrastructure. So it's been actually really nice to see the site being used as much as it is. The ecosystem services and the stormwater systems that we built, they work really well. We've had some pretty staggering storm events. Um, it's, it's actually done exactly what we wanted it to do. 
Um, we are really proud that we actually ended up with the site's gold. Um, we never thought we would get that far, but you know, here we are. Um, my grants crew is super happy for many reasons. And one of the things that I really like to hear is a lot of people say, when they walk into the building, you know, that transparency, you can see the courtyard from the outside when you walk in. And then when you turn back in, you see the landscape on the other side. So it, there is just this general sense of calm. It's not the rara, crazy adrenaline pumping sense of being in an athletic center. Um, and the courtyard is extensively used by students. When they want a quiet place to sit, that's where they go. Um, and last but not least, we have a new landscape standard. Um, Sites is now our standard for all major projects. We never thought we would get, get to this stage, but here we are. Um, so I think similar to the project, uh, the previous project, you know, I think starting early is the important part. You know, set the goals at the outset, drop the criteria, and in our case, um, integrating the team and design, um, including the construction team, are absolutely essential. You have to do it at the beginning, and um, that is, I think, the trick to making it cost effective. And you know, when we rounded up the numbers for this approach versus a traditional approach, you know, we actually ended up, um, you know, comparing very favorably. We didn't really spend anything more. Um, and learning was possible. You know, people came up to speed remarkably quickly. I do want to give a shout out to the GBCI staff. You know, this was something that was new for everyone. We called up folks at GBCI to walk through questions, and they were very ready, very willing to help. So um, really, I think um, this is possible. It's easier than people think. And um, you know, we're really glad that it's setting a new trend on our campus. So thank you. Thank you, Mina and Michael. And, and again, Donna and Garrick, those were just amazing projects. and. Uh, really great to hear from you, like just the process and just why you did this. And um, and uh, now we're going to move into questions. I know we're running a little bit low on time, but so we're going to open it up for questions. Um, I'm going to pass it to Anna Grace to moderate this. Great. And we want to mention that folks who do have to drop off, you will receive the recording. So we may go a few minutes over and make sure to send that all to you. I'm going to start with the first question that was for the um, Fort Missoula project. Could we ask Garrick the value of submitting all the credits at once, as he mentioned on the site's management slide? Yes, um, is what I learned in going through the site certification process is that um, you are telling a um, comprehensive story of your project, and each of the credits have a tendency to build on the on the previous one so being able to carry that all the way through to ensure that that I was telling a comprehensive story and also maintaining all of my numbers so they added up at the end which was a which was a challenge for me at 156 acres thank you Garrick I have a question for Colby that came through. Have you been able to calculate the labor savings or the time savings and what sort of data do you use to, to prove it or justify it? Um, we have not calculated the labor savings and the time savings, but we can act actually get you that information. Um, that, that should not be hard to get. We have a very, very lean grounds crew and they are just super happy not to have to mow you know, 30 plus acres, so. So they mow only twice a year, you know, if that's any indication instead of doing it, you know, every few weeks. Um, and it just takes us a couple of people instead of four or five. But Anna, I can, Anna Grace, I can absolutely send, you know, more detailed numbers to folks. Okay, that would be great. Thank you, we can include that. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, no, I'm going to ignore Paul's question about, I do really want to know how you deal with the snow in the courtyard. Maybe we'll save that. <laughs> um, but we had a question come in around for Fort Missoula. Um, can you provide another example of climate related sites design? Sure. Uh, we spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, reducing and eliminating sumps. 
uh, through uh, sheet flow. Uh, we removed a lot of costs uh, to, of hard infrastructure, such as curb and gutter systems. Again, sheet flow to bioswales. Uh, those are just a couple of uh, the examples. Uh, also good lighting. And uh, to just touch on cost savings, Fort Missoula Regional Park is our most developed park. And if I were to compare it acre to acre of a typical neighborhood park that's also irrigated, it actually costs us less uh, per acre by about 25% because of the design and the way that the infrastructure and the sites uh, implementation took place. Thank you, Donna. I just want to say that these projects are beautiful. They're functional. They are welcoming spaces. And we are really grateful to have had you speak with our, um, with our community today. I'm going to turn it to Danielle to close us out now. Thank you again to all the guest speakers, Anna Grace, Paul, for your help. This is really exciting to be able to share these stories with you and, and uh, with a larger audience, larger, larger sites community. So hopefully this was beneficial. Our next two calls are September 14th and November 9th. And we'll also be at the ASLA Conference on Landscape Architecture. If you're uh, going to be there, let us know. So thank you. Sorry we went a little over, but have a great rest of your week. And thanks you again to the speakers. Bye. <laughs>